Huh? What? Sorry. DVD copy of 2013. Jack the Giant Slayer. I appear to be getting a call from my Blu-ray copy of 2013's Jack the Giant Slayer. Hello? Hi, uh, what is up, man? Have you heard of this cool underground film called Jack the Giant Slayer? What did you say? <laughs> Ryan? 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 <laughs> this video is about a little known film called Jack the Giant Slayer, which, if this video comes out on time, will have released 10 years ago today on the 22nd of March 2013. Yes, I am aware that in the US it released on the 1st of March 2013, but it's a British film starring British people made in Britain, so I'm going to be referring to it as releasing on the on the British fucking release date, okay? 41.2% of US viewers, you're just going to have to deal with it. It's a film I've wanted to make a video about for a long, long time, and there's basically no one who's covered it, like, aside from reviews back when it came out. So if I'm going to do this, it needs to be a long one. Hence it is. And I'm going to go into all the pseudo-intellectual bullshit that I can try and do as a 16-year-old wannabe filmmaker. Let's get into it. In the months of February and March 2011, the main characters of Jack the Giant Slayer were cast. The main actor who was cast was Nicholas Holt, who played Jack in the film. Prior to this, he was probably most well known for his role as Tony Stoneham in Channel 4's teen drama, Skins. The film also had a number of iconic actors in the roles. This includes the likes of Stanley Tucci, Bill Nye, Eddie Marsden, Warwick Davis, who I've actually been in the same room as, and Ewan McGregor. The principal photography started in April of the same year and took place in England locations such as Somerset, Gloucestershire and Norfolk. The film was originally meant to be released earlier than it actually did, but the release date was moved back in post-production to allow for more time for special effects and marketing. Throughout the years of 2012 and early 2013, marketing for Jack the Giant Slayer began. This marketing included movie trailers and posters in train stations, but the piece of marketing that I remember most fondly and that being because it was the most prevalent, was the posters sprawled across buses all throughout England. Now that we've discussed everything that happened before the movie released, it would probably be an appropriate time to get into the main chunk of this video, actually talking about the movie. So let's get into Jack the Giant Slayer. The film opens on a thunderous night with a young Jack played by Michael Self. He's playing with some figures of the Giants while reciting a twisted version of the Giants' iconic fee fi fo fum which originated in the original Jack and the Beanstalk fairy tale, written in 1734. Jack's father, played by Tim Foley, walks in and asks Jack why he's still up. Jack responds saying that the Giants woke him, to which his father responds that it's the thunder. Jack explains that his mother used to say that the Giants caused the thunder. Jack pulls out a book which contains the story of the Giants, and we find out it was his mother's old book. Jack asks his father if he will read the rest of the story to him, to which his father obliges. Throughout the book, we learn that the Giants are just a fictional species, and in the book, a group of monks use magic seeds to grow a pathway in order to seek a god, and the thing that they actually found was a group of Giants who used the Beanstalk, which the monks grew, using the seeds, to come down and feast on those who lived in the village where Jack currently resides. We find out that the Giants developed a taste for mankind, King Eric sought a way to get the Giants to leave. The way he did this was by melting down a Giant's heart and turning it into a crown. The crown allowed King Eric to control the Giants due to the fact the crown was made of a Giant's heart. And so the Giants were banished back to their palace and the Beanstalk was cut down and the Giants were no longer a problem for humankind. When King Eric died, the crown and the remaining magic beans were locked in his tomb with him so that no one else could try and reopen a gate to the Giant's land. The fairy tale is presented via cartoony CGI in this sequence, and that can be forgiven. It doesn't need to be all impressive because it's a fairy tale. And in fact, I like that they went for a more stylized approach for this segment, as opposed to trying to be realistic with the CGI like they do later in the film. After the sequence, we find that a young girl named Isabel was being read the story of the giants at the same time as Jack. We find out that Isabel is a descendant of King Eric. Isabel has gone to sleep, and as Jack is about to go to sleep, he asks his father how he knows that giants aren't real. His father responds that he doesn't, so Jack grabs a book as his father leaves and flips through, and we find out in this fairy tale that the giants intend to come back and wage war and eat the last of Eric's kin, who is obviously Isabel. 
Then we get a title card. The title card takes place in the sky, and the words Jack the Giant Slayer are made out of some sort of old rock, which helps to portray the more gothic and dark feelings that the film will go for later in its runtime. This title card also helps to show the fact that you are indeed watching the 15th live-action gritty and dark reboot of your beloved franchise. We cut to 10 years later as Jack is going to sell his uncle's horse. Jack's uncle tells him to not get distracted, obviously foreshadowing that Jack is about to sell the horse for some magic beans. Jack arrives at a market and then begins to try to sell the horse. While trying to sell the horse, Jack is distracted by a play of Eric the Great, his life being betrayed by Warwick Davis. Jack spots Isabel in the crowd but doesn't say anything to her. This is when a couple of guys go over to Isabel and begin harassing her. Jack goes over like a single male and tells the harassers to do one but gets decked by them in the process. Jack suggests that they let Isabel go right as fucking Obi-Wan Kenobi! Obi-Wan Kenobi. <laughs> pulls up on a horse, causing the harassers to drop to their knees, along with everyone else watching the play. They then do a Marvel-esque bit, where Jack literally says the parody line of There's something behind me isn't there. There's something behind me, isn't there? Obi-Wan, yes, I'm calling him Obi-Wan for the rest of the video. I don't care if his character's name is Elmont, he's fucking Obi-Wan Kenobi, okay? Anyway, as I was saying, Obi-Wan then tells Jack to get on his knees, although probably not for the same reason I want Nicholas Holt on his knees. Before we move on, I want to quickly appreciate... Obi-Wan's hair in this film, I'm not going to mention it again, but I think I should quickly, I mean, look at the fucking volume of this shit, man, how the fuck is he getting it to stand at that volume, my lord, literally defying the laws of gravity, and not to mention, it's, it's quite the look, quite an interesting look, uh, to say the least, my friends think he looks like a lesbian, I'd say he's closer to piratinical when he was in the ice gem phase. Anyway, Jack obliges and kneels. Obi-Wan and Isabel then leave, and Jack leaves as well, only to see that the cart attached to its horse that he was selling has been stolen. We cut to these guys, and we learn that Roderick is going into an arranged marriage with Isabel. As they are talking, we see the monk acting a bit suspicious. Next thing we know, the monk has stolen the magic beans and has done a runner. They close the gates to the city so that the monk can't escape. The monk is now panicking because when he gets found out, he's definitely going to get executed. So he's thrilled when he sees Jack still trying to sell his horse. He offers Jack 10 coppers for the horse. And Jack is even more thrilled to learn that he's about to make 10 coppers off his horse. But is quickly let down when he finds out that the monk doesn't actually have the money on him. And while Jack would like to sell the man the horse and collect the money later, he simply can't or his uncle would go mental. The monk offers Jack the magic beans as collateral. Jack isn't very impressed as they're just ordinary Heinz beans. But the monk explains that these beans are in fact relics from long ago. And he says that the beans have the power to change the world. So if Jack takes them, he needs to keep them safe and do not get them wet. And well, you already know what happens next. Jack's uncle makes Jack lose one of the beans and it gets wet. Next thing you know, there's a great big giant beanstalk sprouting through Jack's gaff and Isabel gets taken up to the giant's land with it, but not before Jack tries and fails to rescue her. Jack falls from the beanstalk back to the human domain. Sorry if that felt a bit rushed. I just figured we all know what's going to happen. I might as well just get to it instead of beating around the bush for a good another five minutes. Oh yeah, the monk gets gay medded while all this is happening. Anyway, we cut to Jack waking up on the ground the next day. The king asks Jack what he was doing with Isabel's bracelet, and Jack explains that he didn't steal it, but that Isabel came to his house, and then, well, then she got taken up the beanstalk. Obi-Wan recognises Jack, and when asked where Jack's house is by the king, all Jack can do is solemnly point to the sky where his house now lies. We get our first shot of the beanstalk in all its glory, and I must say it doesn't look half bad. The CGI is decent, and well, it all looks decent for the most part. Just try to ignore the posters, as it looks a bit shit there. The king tells Obi-Wan to assemble a team of men to climb up the beanstalk to rescue Isabel. As this happens, Jack's uncle pulls up, and he is pissed. Rightfully so, I mean... His whole house is gone for fuck's sake. Jack volunteers to help Isabel and reluctantly they allow him to join their team. We get a sequence of the team scaling the beanstalk. Jack asks Obi-Wan what he thinks is up there to which Obi-Wan responds with one of the coldest lines in cinema ever in my humble opinion. I'm not a superstitious man, Jack. I never suppose I simply prepare for everything. Anyway, Jack suggests that perhaps there may be giants up the beanstalk to which Obi-Wan says that giants aren't real. I pray he's wrong about the giants not being real, otherwise we're about to have a giant case of false advertising, considering the film is called Jack the Giant Slayer. Did, did you like what I did with that pun? Giant case of false advertising? Jack? Jack? Giant? I'll see myself out. Jack loses his grip on the beanstalk and nearly falls to his death, but thankfully he grabs on and saves himself, which is good, otherwise we may have never got the absolute masterpiece that is the menu. They get higher up the beanstalk when Obi-Wan implies that Jack is only doing this to impress Isabel. Jack says he isn't, 
But I mean, come on, look at this cheeky guy's face. He knows exactly what he's doing. Come on. They get to a point where they have to zipline across to another point on the beanstalk, and Jack feels exactly how I feel when I go on zip lines. Except the zip lines I go on aren't thousands of feet in the air without safety precautions. The ones I go on look like this. Jack goes across the zip line but falls and dies. Nah, I'm just kidding. I mean, look at the runtime bar on this video. We've still got ages left. He actually falls onto another part of the beanstalk. They climb up the beanstalk some more, but two people fall and call for help. But Roderick, like the twat he is, tells Wick to cut the rope, sending them to their death. Dickhead. Obi-Wan asks what happened, and Roderick, the twat he is, lies and says that the line snapped. Yet again, dickhead. Jack wakes up the next morning to see a beautiful view and a sculpted giant's head. They're almost to the top now. The rest of the group wake up and check Jack's house to see if Isabel is there. She's not. So they check the inside of the sculpted giant's head, and they discover that Isabel has climbed up the giant's head to the giant's world. Obi-Wan gives out rations, and Roderick asks if that's all they have. Obi-Wan tells him that the rest of the rations went down with the two blokes Roderick and Wick cut loose. Look at that, Roderick. It's the consequences of your actions. You twat. I, I, I fucking hate this character, man. Genuinely, like, worst character of the film. And it's, it's, it's great that I hate him. You're not supposed to side with him. He's the human antagonist of the film. But, I mean, just, just how much they get me to hate him whenever I watch this, really does go to show how well the film is written, how well the character is written, and how well Stanley Tucci plays a massive cunt. As Obi-Wan and the gang walk off, Wick and Roderick hold Jack at knife point. This really is a film set in Britain. They ask him where the Heinz beans are, and with the threat of being killed, Jack reluctantly hands over the beans. Little does Roderick know, Jack actually kept one hidden. I'm sure that won't come back later. They find a tree with carvings from Isabel, so she could find her way back. I really like this detail. It shows Isabel's intelligence. She's not just some damsel in distress that you'd see in these type of films. It takes what would otherwise be a 2D stereotype of a character and gives some depth. And I love to see that in my films. And After a bit more walking, they find another mark. This one's only half finished. Something has clearly happened to Isabel. Jack finds her giant storybook and informs the others that she must have hid relatively close to where they are. Jack suggests that she was snatched. <laughs> a giant it probably was. That, that was a horrible Yoda impression, I'm so sorry. Nevertheless, Obi-Wan splits up the group and they search for Isabel. And he says the line... Take the high ground. He said the thing. He said the thing, you know, the thing from the other thing he's in. I have the high ground. This is so epic. They're now confronted with the fact that the giants may in fact be real. They begin walking across a massive puddle where they're greeted with our first... I don't want to say horror sequence because it's not exactly scary, no matter how hard it's trying to be. Slightly creepy. That's what I'm going with. It's a slightly creepy sequence. In this sequence, Jack and Craw are captured in a net. Obi-Wan, Craw and Jack all scramble to cut themselves out of the net when a flock of birds fly by, cawing loudly. I think we all know what's about to happen here. Both Jack and Craw escape the net, but it's too late. We hear the sounds of heavy footsteps as they all scramble to hide. A giant walks into the frame. We only see its feet, clearly, and when we see the upper half of its body, we see it through the water, muddying and obscuring the view. This technique of hiding the giant's appearance allows us to build up the appearance in our minds, which creates the horror in the sequence, as anything our brains conjure up will no doubt be scarier than the actual giant. Crawl peeks out and we see the back of the giant. Yet again, the film hides the front, leaving our minds to fill in the blank. That is until the giant picks up the tree Crawley standing behind, and we finally get a full, uncensored frontal view of the first giant in this film. And it is as underwhelming as you could expect. The CGI is also really ugly, which I mean, in most films would be a negative, but in this film where the giants are meant to be ugly looking creatures, the bad CGI kind of helps add to the f I will say this though, I like the bit where we see Craw run quite far away, only for the giant to catch up to him in like three steps. It really helps to show that our heroes are up against something that outperforms them in every aspect. It's a great way to build up the difficulty of their mission so quickly. Anyway, the giant crushes Craw with his hand and we get an up close shot of the giant's face, which is grotesque, I'll give it that. That. but all it does is really show that this film really is set in Britain. I mean, look at this guy's teeth. Obi-Wan attempts to go up against the giant only to be kicked away and knocked out. The giants pick up both Kroll and Obi and walk off, meaning that the only person to come out of that confrontation unscathed is Jack. Jack chases the giant and we cut back to the infinitely more boring sections of the film, those being the ones containing Roderick. Him, Wick and this guy bald, yes that is his name, go to the edge of the giant's world and... You already know what's coming based on how much of a cunt Roderick is. That's right, he pushes Bald off of the edge. For no reason! I could almost justify him cutting the other guys even if it was cunty. Because they were holding him and Wick down. But I can't justify this. He killed that motherfucker for shits and giggles, man. 
All of a sudden, a giant turns up and grabs Wick. He bites his head off and another giant is about to kill Roderick when he pulls out the crown to control the giants. For fuck's sake, man! We were almost rid of the cunt! We cut back to Jack chasing the giant who's got Craw and Obi-Wan. Jack gets to a massive part of the giant civilization as we cut to a giant named Big Fallon who has another giant's head on his shoulder, aptly named Small Fallon, asking Isabel if she believes in God. Isabel says she does and Big Fallon asks if she'd like to meet him. Isabel says not yet, so Big Fallon tells her she doesn't have to if she just answers some questions. When asked how she got to the giant's land, Isabel refuses to answer as she knows that would result in the giants going back down to the human realm. Big Fallon asks where the others are, Isabel says she came alone. Big Fallon explains that they know she's lying as people will be looking for her since she's a descendant of King Eric the Terrible. That's what they call Eric the Great in the giant's world. It's in this scene we also learn that giants have a Northern Irish accent, which checks out since Northern Irish people do actually look like this. Big Fallon asks if the giants have faded into legend, to which Isabel says nothing. Big Fallon then takes Isabel and flaunts her about to the other giants. As he does, the giant holding Craw and Obi turns up. We learn his name, Fee. By this time, Obi and Craw have both woken up. Big Fallon asks Craw how to get down, but Craw is a sigma and tells Big Fallon to choke on his bones. Big Fallon doesn't take too well to this and eats Craw there and then. We cut to Jack running across a bridge. He sees a bunch of giants running into the castle and they argue over who gets to eat Isabel. One giant, Fun, says he wants to as he found her, but Big Fallon says that rules of the hunt don't apply here as Isabel is different due to her relation to King Eric. Fun says that Big Fallon is abusing his power and that he isn't their king. Roderick pulls up and says that's true since he has the crown, making him their king. The giants all begin to kneel before Roderick as Obi-Wan tells Roderick to have the giants release them, but Roderick doesn't because he's a prick. He tells the giants that tomorrow he will take them down to the human realm as his first act as their new king. He cuts to Jack exploring once more when he hears Isabel begging a giant named Cook to let them go. Can you guess why he's called Cook? It... Because he's the cook, in, in, in case you didn't guess that. I'm the cook. to a scene where Obi-Wan is slammed down onto a pastry and what follows is the scene where my vor fetish probably began. Just want to iterate, that's a joke. I don't have a vor fetish, I promise. Just put now there before anyone takes it seriously. Obi-Wan is rolled up into a pastry as Jack creeps into the kitchen. He begins cutting Obi-Wan out of the pastry as Obi sounds a lot like me talking to my friends after they had to revive me because I got knocked down while dealing with it at 4v1 in Fortnite. He tells Jack, I had this, Jack. I took my eye off the ball just for a moment, but I had this. Mm -hmm. Cook comes back over and Jack gives Obi-Wan the knife to cut himself out as he runs away. Cook places Obi and a few pigs into an oven and they begin cooking. Jack climbs up to a knife rack as Cook cuts up some vegetables. Cook is about to kill Isabel before he can. Jack jumps down, planting a knife directly into Cook's back. Obi-Wan escapes as Jack is gripping onto the knife for dear life while Cook tries to grab him from behind. Cook accidentally stumbles into a wall, planting the knife even further into his own back, killing himself. We've just got our first giant kill in a film called Jack the Giant Slayer. I'm surprised it took us an hour to get here, but nonetheless, we move. Back on human land, the people are having a beanstalk themed carnival. The king struggles with the fact that giants may soon come down the beanstalk, and thus he should cut it down, but doing so would result in him never seeing his daughter again. Roderick tells a giant he has a mission for him as we cut to Obi-Wan as he talks to an imaginary force ghost of Crawl. Jack helps to stop Isabel's bleeding as she reflects that this may be all her fault since she ran away. But Jack comforts her, telling her it's not her fault. Jack, Isabel and Obi all make their way to the edge of the giant's realm. They make it there and we see the giant Roderick gave the mission to. He's laying asleep by the edge. Obviously, he's meant to be guarding it, though, so that Jack and the gang can't make it down and war the humans. Jack finds a way to get rid of the giant. He and Obi take a bee's hive and drop it into the giant's helmet. The giant wakes up and accidentally stumbles off the edge. Obi tells Jack and Isabel to go without him as he's going to kill Roderick. Jack tells Obi-Wan that this wasn't part of the plan, but Obi asks Jack if he's ever killed a man. Calling back to Jack's previous line, have you killed a giant? Have you ever killed a giant before? Yeah, Did you ever kill a man? These two lines help show the difference between humans and giants despite their shared likeness. It also helps to show Jack's naivety while also showing Obi-Wan's strength as characters. Any man can kill a giant, but it takes someone of Obi-Wan's calibre to look another man in the eyes and kill him without hesitation when the time comes. Before we move on, I just want to quickly take another look at that Have You Ever Killed a Giant scene because I just love it. It's got to be one of my favourite scenes of the film. 
Uh, it really shows off Jack and Obi-Wan's banter quite well. And it's just one of my favourite things about the film. I'm going to roll the clip now. This is a terrible idea. Have you ever killed a giant before? And you've killed, what, one? Which makes you an expert now. Weren't you in an oven an hour ago? Jack gives Obi his knife, and Obi gives Jack his badge, telling him that he's one of them now. This cements Jack's change as he's not the same lowly commoner he climbed up the beanstalk as. Now, he's a hero. We cut to the human land as the sleeping giant from earlier falls back to the ground and dies. That giant might have fallen, but not as hard as I've fallen for today's sponsor, Honeygain. Honeygain is a service I genuinely use all the time, and I know people always say that in their sponsorship advertisements and stuff, but I do actually use this service, and I have actually made some money off of it. What is Honeygain, you may be asking? Honeygain is a way to make passive income. You share your internet with them, and they convert that into money that you can use to pay your bills. Now, is it going to make you rich? No, it's not. But it has saved me a number of times when it comes to paying my Netflix subscription or my Spotify subscription. So if you need a way to just pay for those every once in a while, Honeygain is pretty fucking good. It's really easy to download as well. You simply just go to their website, click the download page, and it's basically done immediately. You can get it on your PC and your phone, and that's all you need to know. Sign up to Honeygain using my code RYAN5 and you'll get $5 free. So, if you want to start earning passive income right now and get five free dollars while you're at it, then go down into the description, click my link, and sign up. With the realization the giants are real, the king orders the beanstalk be cut down. The king takes his sword and asks his daughter to forgive him before he begins to hack away at the beanstalk. Everyone else joins him. We cut to Jack and Isabel climbing down the beanstalk. They share a kiss before Jack spots lights below. He questions what people are doing. Back on Giant Land, Obi-Wan is woken up by the army of giants about to climb down the beanstalk. Obi spots Roderick and pulls Jack's knife. Roderick walks to the edge and is about to drop the beans, but he turns his back, which is when Obi gets to jump on him and tackles him. They get into a scuffle, leading them into the giant's head from where they first arrived. It seems Obi-Wan is about to lose the fight as he drops his knife, and Roderick climbs atop him, trying to stab at him, before Obi grabs his knife he dropped moments ago and slices at Roderick's face with the knife in his mouth. Obi kicks Roderick off of him, but once again Roderick gains the upper hand, knocking Obi-Wan off the sculpture, but luckily Obi-Wan is just barely able to grip back on. As he's hanging from the tooth of the statue of the giant, Roderick begins cutting at Obi's fingers to make him let go, but Obi-Wan turns the blade into Roderick's foot and then to his stomach. The scene also gives us yet another cold Sigma moment from Obi-Wan. I may not be the hero of this story! At least I get to see how it ends! Obi climbs back up, but right as he's able to grab the crown, the giant's rescuer now dead. Finally! Roderick, and Big Fallon takes the crown for himself, meaning he is now the king of the giants. We cut to the human land as they finally manage to pull the beanstalk from its roots. It begins to fall while Jack and Isabel are still climbing down. Obi-Wan sees the falling beanstalk and jumps onto it. The giants are dismayed as their last opportunity to get to the human world falls from their grasp right in front of them. Jack and Isabel jump off the beanstalk to safety, and so does Obi-Wan. The beanstalk crashes mostly into the water, causing very little damage, which when you put into perspective how big it is, it's quite shocking. Then Isabel and her father reunite, and I'll be honest, for as much as I've spent this video sucking this film's dick, the acting here is horrific. It's stiffer than the sock under my bed. I just don't buy that he's actually happy to see his daughter again. Isabel reveals to the king that Roderick is a massive twat, and the king is understandably shocked, as he trusted Roderick. The king tries to take Isabel back to the castle, she's more concerned with where Jack has run off to. The king then looks his daughter dead in the eyes, and asks, who's Jack? Motherfucker, he spent days risking his life to save your daughter, and you don't even remember him? My lord, I mean, I know he only did it to rizz her up, but still, give my man some fucking respect. Isabel then explains who Jack is, and the king remembers. The king finds Jack, and thanks him for rescuing Isabel, by giving him a bag of what I'm assuming is gold coins. The king leaves and Jack drops some game on Isabel. Clearly he has the thing for women in uniform. Jack gives Isabel the giant storybook as a thing to remember him by, but she declines the gift, stating that she won't need any help remembering. Jack and Isabel begin sharing a sweet goodbye before the king cuts it off. Jack watches Isabel ride off as John Ottman's beautiful score comes in. I haven't spoken much about the music in this film, but my god is it brilliant. Like, genuinely, so fucking good. I've been listening to it uh, a lot over the course of making this video for the last few months. Yes, I've been working on this video for months. Um, and it's fucking brilliant, man. I must have gone through the whole thing, like, three times by now. Um, Ottman is fucking brilliant, genuinely. He knows exactly what the, uh, soundtrack needs to be to aid the film, and I fucking love that about him. Every track is grand, and that really helps add the, to the scale of the film and stuff. And, you know, uh, for an example of a grand track, take, uh, Jack and Isabel. But 
There's also more sombre ones, uh, like Goodbye, which is what is playing in the scene I was just talking about. Uh, let's have a little look at that. Bottom knows exactly what every track needs to be, and it's fucking great. And one thing I love about the music is every track, even the more jovial ones, have a sense of malice to them, you know? Like, like a calm before the storm. It's fucking brilliant. I genuinely love this soundtrack. I think it's up there with uh, Murray Gold's work on Doctor Who, and even Christabel Tapia de Vere's work on Utopia. Wait, I got Utopia reference in there. Um, it's fucking brilliant, man. If there's one thing I want you to do, aside from go watch this film after uh, this video ends, I want you to go listen to this soundtrack. It's fucking great. Uh, Ryan Jizzy back again. Uh, there's a few things I forgot to mention about the soundtrack that I quickly want to talk about. Um, I love that it supplements the film as opposed to taking centre stage. I know that sounds like fucking retarded because that's what music is supposed to be, but I've seen a fair few films where the music is centre stage and I feel like I'm just watching a 90-minute music video for it. And if that were one in every couple of films, I'd be fine with it, but it, it's a big handful of them, and I'm glad Jack the Giant Slayer isn't one of those films. Another thing I love is how well the music blends together, to the point where I got through three songs uh, while I was... Um, scripting this thing, and they just seamlessly went from song to song to song. And that probably sounds like a bad thing, you know, each song blending together. It, w it would sound like it's um, not distinguished enough, but the songs are distinguished enough that even though the intros and outros blend in together and it sounds like one long track, I can tell that I'm on different tracks just based on how distinguished it is. Right, now that I'm done sucking off this film's soundtrack, we can get back to the video. Big Fallon stand atop the giant's mountain, looking across the sky as he sees that the beanstalk, the giant's only way down to the human world, is now gone. Small Fallon directs Big Fallon's attention to the sack of beans. Luckily for the giants, they've got a new way back down, through not just one beanstalk, but five. They throw the beans to the river, and the beanstalks begin sprouting almost immediately. Which seems inconsistent since Jack's been laid in the rain for a few hours before sprouting, but I suppose the higher water supply increased the beanstalk sprout time. The giants begin to jump down the beanstalk, and we get a shot of Roderick's corpse, which is so cathartic for me to see, I just really fucking hate him as a character. Big Fallon pulls Dumb aside and reminds him that the princess is mine, and they both jump down the beanstalk with the rest of the giants. On human land, Jack sits, looking at his last bean and the destroyed beanstalk, when he spots his old horse, and we get a reunion that is more heartfelt than the one between Isabel and her father. That's right, this film managed to make me feel more happiness watching a man and a horse be reunited than a literal father and daughter. I don't know why, it's just, it's just a better fucking scene. It's such a confusing way that they managed to screw that up, but this scene is so good. Nonetheless, Jack spots something in the reflection of the water his horse was drinking. Can you guess what it is? It's beanstalks. Jack begins to ride towards Isabel and her father as the giant's beanstalks begin to hit the ground. I'll mention it here since I haven't really mentioned it anywhere else in this video, but I really like the cinematography of this film. It's pretty good. I mean, it's no Better Call Saul or Utopia, it's nowhere near that kind of level of cinematography, but there's still some cool shots in here that I quite like. For example, the one we just saw of the beanstalks in the water. I think that's a cool shot. I also like majority of the shots of the Giant's Realm and also of the beanstalk itself. I feel like those shots are great and they're really good for the film. So, yeah, while it's not up there with some of the better shows with cinematography that is amazing, it's definitely quite good. Jack tells a monk to ring the alarm bell as he continues to ride towards Isabel and her father. He eventually catches up to them and begins to scream warnings of the incoming giants, but it's too late. The giants emerge from the trees, chasing after them. The giants begin whacking humans off their horses, killing them. Jack and the gang begin getting closer to the castle. The citizens want to snake them up and close the drawbridge, leaving them to the giants. But Obi-Wan, the chat he is, tells them not to, and that the drawbridge stays open till I give the command. The men in the castle begin attacking, shooting the now oil-infested moat using bows and flaming arrows, which causes it to go up in flames, preventing any giants from being able to get through the water. They begin to raise the drawbridge as everyone gets in, everyone that is except Jack. Both the giants and Jack are dangerously close to the castle now. Jack manages to jump onto the rising drawbridge, but so does Big Fallon, as he climbs onto the drawbridge, but luckily he loses his grip and gets shot into the fiery oil that lay below. It seems the giants have lost as the drawbridge is now almost fully raised. Both Big Fallon and the Small Fallon burn to death. Big Fallon makes one last ditch effort for help, calling for Fum. But, because of their rivalry which has been set up extensively throughout the film, Fum gives him the proverbial middle finger and takes his place as the leader of the giants. He instructs the giants to get the hooks. You'd assume both the Fallons are dead now, but no, we see them swim off to a nearby sewer grate. Isabel and Obi-Wan reunite 
Obi-Wan tells the king that Roderick is dead and reveals to the others that the giants have the crown. We see the bell from before getting chucked towards the castle as those aforementioned hooks come into play. They get chucked onto the drawbridge and the giants begin pulling. The men begin to pull back and the king instructs Isabel and Jack to light the beacon at the top of the tower, warning other kingdoms of the giants. We see Jack and Isabel begin to head towards the light. Jack asks if there's been grave robbers and we pan to King Eric's defiled grave, calling back to earlier as the monks pull their Mr. Krabs. Am I really gonna defile this grave for beans? Of course I am! <laughs> we cut to bubbling water. I wonder who that could be. Despite the human's best efforts, they can't outpour the giants and the drawbridge begins to be lowered. We cut to Jack and Isabel as they run through the castle when a thud is heard. The ground begins to crack as Big Fallon climbs through it. We cut to the fight at the drawbridge as it seems the humans are gaining the upper hand as the giants begin to get shot down by hundreds of arrows. But Farm deals with that problem pretty quickly as he destroys the weapon with his slingshot. Back in the castle, Big Fallon taunts the princess as he searches for her. We see that Jack and Isabel are hidden in the king's cloak. We watch as Fallon performs a bit of a jump scare, which honestly does catch me off guard every time I watch it, even though I know it's coming. Nevertheless, the Fallons find Jack and Isabel, and they begin to flee as the Fallons chase after her. Jack and Isabel keep running, but eventually Big Fallon smashes through a wall and grabs Isabel in his clutches. Jack grabs a sword, getting ready to slay one last giant before this flick ends, and... Big Fallon catches him mid-jump. I gotta say, I love the subversion, as you expect Jack to kill Big Fallon, as the hero always does in the end of these movies. That being in a dramatic and over-the-top, heroic way. But, instead, Jack the Giant Slayer opts for Jack to use his smarts to defeat the villain, which I fucking love, as we've seen Jack be nothing but resourceful throughout this film. It's nice to see they don't just chuck that resourcefulness away in favour of a more Hollywood blockbuster ending, which, to be honest, probably would have pleased the teen demographic more than the one that we get. So, Jack, using his brains, grabs Chekhov's bean, and as he's about to be eaten, drops it into Big Fallon's mouth. We follow the bean all the way until he hits Big Fallon's stomach acid, and as you expect, a beanstalk begins to sprout from inside Fallon. We watch as small Fallon's head gets crushed between two vines, and he lets out his last two words, those being... Oh, oh. I will admit, this bit always felt a bit pandering to me, uh, even when I was a child watching this thing. It's... So stupid. It's like the film just going, you know, oh, look, guys, you know, we may be rated 12, uh, but we can we can still swear. We can still tease swearing. Like, that, the film doesn't benefit in any way from you having that horrible tease. It's not even a joke. In general, I just hate when movies do that. And having it in this film, bit of a bit of a bummer for me, considering I've spent nearly 35 minutes plugging it to you thus far. She swear teases aside, Jack and Isabel escape the two Fallons. We cut to the humans outside as the giants have finally managed to pull down the drawbridge, and right as Obi-Wan and the men are about to be killed, the rest of the beans talk that Jack caused sprouts out, destroying the castle. Suddenly the giants all begin to kneel, and we get a parallel of an earlier scene, where Jack thinks people are kneeling for him, and says, there's something behind me isn't there, when in fact, they are kneeling for Obi-Wan. But this time, it is Obi-Wan who says the line, there's something behind me isn't there, as he sees that they are kneeling for Jack. Once again, this helps to show Jack's transition from a commoner to a hero, which was also previously established in an earlier scene where Obi-Wan gives him the badge. Everyone turns to see Jack crown atop his head as everyone cheers. The crown is turned into the king's crown as we know it today, and Jack begins to narrate, and we dissolve into Jack reading a story to his child. That story of being of how he and Isabel, their mother, met. The children ask Jack about the crown, and Jack says it's safe. His kids ask him to tell the story of the giants again, and so he does. And in that cyclical structure fashion, the monologue we heard at the start of the film is read by Jack. This is intercut with people telling the story, but slightly changed as details get muddled. The horse becomes a cow, and the monk becomes an old man. Essentially, the story morphs into the story we know today, that being of Jack and the Beanstalk. After Jack the Giant's last release, it went on to gain a box office of about 197 million US dollars, which when you consider the film's budget of $185 million, means it was a major flop. It only made $12 million in profit, which, when you take the average cinema ticket price of $9, and then you divide it by the $12 million that it made, that means that only 1,333,333 people took the plunge to go and see the film, which is absolutely fucking dreadful. But... Why did the film flop so horrendously? Well, there's definitely a number of reasons, which I'm now going to go over. First off, the film was marketed as a grittier adaptation of Jack and the Beanstalk, and the name was changed from Jack the Giant 
killer to Jack the Giant Slayer to seem more child friendly. That doesn't work. You can't be gritty and appeal to children. Another reason is that they pushed the release back to do reshoots, which just added to the budget and, and overall meant that it was going to cost more to break even. I'd also hazard a guess to say that constantly changing the release date meant that anyone who possibly was going to go see it almost definitely got confused and then didn't. There's a bunch of other reasons as to why the film flopped as well. Uh, they'll be linked in. There's an article linked in the description going, going through it if you uh, really care. But despite Jack the Giant Slayer being a massive flop, that didn't stop the actors in it. They went on to do bigger and much more profitable things. Granted, half the cast was already fucking huge before they did the film. But uh, ignore that. Ignore that. Nicholas Holt, who plays Jack, went on to do the menu in Mad Max Fury Road. Ewan McGregor, who played Elmont, despite my insistence on calling him Obi-Wan throughout the entire fucking video, went on to do Christopher Robin, Doctor Sleep and Obi-Wan. Eleanor Tomlinson, who played Isabel, appeared in Colette. The War of the Worlds and Love Wedding Repeat. Stanley Tucci, who played Roderick, went on to appear in The Hunger Games Mocking Day Part 1 and the TV show Central Park. Ian McShane, who played King Bromwell, went on to appear in the critically acclaimed John Wick franchise. Bill Nye, who played Fallon, went on to star in The World's End, also known as the best of the Cornetto trilogy. If you disagree with me, you are wrong. Ewan Bremner, who played Wick, appeared in Sorting the Battlefield alongside Bill Nye, as well as the sequel to Trains Brian. Eddie Marsden, who played Cruel, has had the most active career since Shut the Giant Slayer. He's appeared in a bunch of films, most of which film pretty well. I'm not going to list any. There's, there's just too many. On the other hand, my best mate Warwick Davies, who played Old Ham, has had the least active career since Shut the Giant Slayer. He only really hosts Tenable, and even then I haven't fucking seen that in about 10 years, so who knows what happened there. Finally, Ben Daniels, who played Thumb, has appeared in Flesh and Bone and Jupiter's Legacy. So the actors have obviously been prospering since the film's release, but what about the cast and crew? Well, director Brian Singer went on to direct X-Men Days of Future Past and Bohemian Rhapsody, both of which are fucking phenomenal in my opinion. John Hartman, who composed the film, went on to do X-Men Days of Future Past and X-Men Apocalypse, and according to Google, that, that was it. He, he fucking died after those two. One last thing that happened after the release of the movie is that they made a Flash game called Jack the Giant Slayer Fallon's Fury, which is based on the ending of the movie in which he plays Fallon. The aim of the game is to run towards the castle. You, you wrap up points by destroying objects in your way and clicking on them with your mouse. I can only find two videos of the game as it appears to have been lost to time. There's a link to the game in the description of one of the videos showing gameplay. But the game is unplayable on that site, so I don't see any luck. Oh yeah, by the way, while gathering resources for the video, I found this old screenshot of an ad page from Yahoo that suggests that there were other games available to play, these being Cloister Defense and Jack's Giant Race. From my research, no videos appear to be out there showing gameplay of Cloister Defense, but there are two videos showing gameplay of Jack's Giant Race, which you can see playing right now. You shall return below with me as your new king. Are you mad? I'm talking to giants at the moment. Oh! 
Why? It's Jack! To conclude, Jack the Giant Slayer is an immensely underrated film that I, I really urge you to watch if, if this video has uh, piqued your interest at all. Or don't. I mean, you spent 40 minutes watching a video on it anyway. You know what happens. You, you cannot watch it if you like, but I think you're gay if you don't. You, you wouldn't want that, would you? You wouldn't want me to think you're a homosexual, would you? Although, if you do go to watch the film, make sure to watch Jack the Giant Slayer and not Jack the Giant Killer. Jack the Giant Killer is a film that released 10 days apart from Jack the Giant Slayer and only has 2.2 .2 on IMDb. Jack the Giant Slayer has 6.2. That's right, my film is better than yours. All jokes aside, I will have a link in the description to where you can go watch it and, you know, listen to the soundtrack and all that good stuff. If you are interested in doing so, you can go check the links in the description. And who knows, maybe if this video somehow gains enough traction, they'll make Jack the Giant Slayer 2, which they really should have. That final shot of the Giant's Realm, you know, teasing it, which I didn't actually show in the summary, but it was there, really did lend itself for a sequel. It's definitely not going to happen, but hey, you can you can watch the film, and yeah, if there was even the tiniest spike, I'd be so ego-fueled. I'd be like, yes, I put the film, it, I, get, I made five people watch the film, gah. Anyway, I don't really know how to end this thing. I've literally been working on it since, like, last year. Uh, was meant to come out March 18th this year. It's now August. Um... It's been far too fucking long. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go get some fucking sleep and rest and rejuvenation. Uh, roll, roll the credits. I don't know how to end this thing. Bye. my closing thoughts on this video because I want to talk about how I made it because it took fucking ages and I figured no one's gonna be here might as well experiment with a different camera angle uh, if you ever wanted to be in bed with me now you know what it feels like also you're sick uh, no but really this video has been in the works for fucking ages so if you are watching this little post credit scene or what the fuck I'm gonna call this thank you for sticking around to the very fucking end uh, I started this thing in like 2022, uh, early 2022. It's now August 2023. It's been fucking ages, over a year. Um, this thing was meant to come out in March this year for the 10 year anniversary of Jack the Giant Slayer. That obviously didn't happen. Um, and I was really unhealthy while making it. Like, barely ate, barely slept. I was sitting in front of a computer screen for about 18 hours a day, barely fucking sleeping. I got it knocked out for th in three days. The uh, first cut, because I wanted to get it out for the 10th anniversary. Obviously, you should copyright it, because I was using video footage. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, I got ill while making the first cut, actually. That was annoying. Y you could really hear it, I think, in the uh, like later video recording bits. My voice being like, <laughs> like fucking dying on me. Uh, I don't know if that was because I was just basically subjecting myself to personal hell. Not even fucking showering like I, my clothes didn't change for three days for sake of continuity um you can obviously see in this new version my change my clothes changed like five or six times um 
because I was like, I'm not going to put myself through fucking that level of torture. Like, that, it was genuinely, like, horrible. Shouldn't have done it to myself. Really regret it. But nonetheless, that was the first drop. And then it didn't get accepted, obviously. Second cut, um, I ended up cutting it into loads of different parts in the hopes that uh, YouTube would be like, yeah, fuck it, let's let it put it up in, like, 10, 15-minute parts. Three, three 10, 15-minute parts. They obviously didn't accept it either. Um, so I decided to do this cut, uh, which is just screenshots, minimal amounts of uh, audio or video from the actual film being used. Hopefully it gets accepted. Not too sure if it will. Um, I'm very happy with this cut. It, it was definitely, you know, since it's my longest video ever, I think right now it's sitting at 42 minutes, uh, probably 45 by the time this clip gets added. But nonetheless, I think it is my biggest experiment yet, like in terms of video length, what it's like, the value, like, I don't want to say entertainment value, maybe, not sure, like education value, because I definitely give like a history lesson on how the film was made and shit. And, you know, just getting to talk about a film I love, that's really fucking cool. Even whipped out the green screen, that's now permanently up in, uh, on the side of my room over there. Um, never fucking gonna use it again, probably. But for this video, I thought I'd whip it out, give it a try. Not the best thing, but we fuck. And obviously, this shot, this is an interesting shot. I'm really, like, experimenting with my different camera angles. Because, you know, if it's gonna be my biggest project yet, and I'm definitely gonna push it out to everyone, I might as well try some interesting shit. Um, yeah, not really too much to say, what to say now. It's currently 23rd of August, uh, 2023. Not too sure if this cut's gonna get accepted. I hope it does. Um... I'd love to get this thing out before I go on holiday, uh, which is on the Monday from when this video is released. Who knows? Who knows? Um, yeah, feel like I'm blabbering now. If you've watched this far, I love you. I appreciate you. You're definitely a real one for sitting through 40 minutes of my waffling. If you clicked off, I'm, I'm really not... I'm, I, I can't blame you. I can't blame you. I'm a, I would, I'm a bit sad, you know. I really need the retention for YouTube to push this thing out. But if you clicked off, I don't blame you. Anyway, I'm rambling. Um, yeah, bye. Thank you so much for watching. You mean everything to me. I might, I might take a break after this video, um, just to you know, catch up on some shit and you know, because I've been working on this and it's a big project and I want to let it fester before I come back to YouTube and do more regular stuff again. Um, I really did enjoy this though. I do want to make more like half an hour plus sort of documentaries. Is that what you call it? Like retrospective type shit. I think that's a better word for it. Um, you know, yeah. So. Yeah, I don't know what else to say. Thank you so much for watching. If, yeah, I'm going to stop rambling. Bye, bye, goodbye, bye. To, to the end card now, bye.